Welcome back to our Advent Pilgrimage of Peace. We've made our way all the way from Nazareth here to the beautiful hill country of Judea in a place called Ein Kadim. You notice we're inside of a cave. We were outside of the Grotto of Mary in Nazareth and they not only lived like that there, but all over the country. The innermost part of the homes were usually carved inside of a rock. And we're here because there in Nazareth, we spoke about when the angel Gabriel came and announced to Mary who the true Prince of Peace would be, not Augustus, not some of the other great rulers in the world, right? So we're gonna continue our speaking about peace. And we came here because Gabriel, before he even spoke with Mary, spoke with the owner of this house, and that is Zechariah. So in Ein Karem, well, first of all, what does it mean? Ein means spring. Karem means the vineyard or the field. And so when you come to this place right outside of Jerusalem in this hill country, like again, it says in the gospel, it's breezy, beautiful vineyards, olive trees, many things grow here. And even today, people come from Jerusalem to rest here. And so Ein Karem, the spring of the vineyard is a place for rest. And the spring here in the city is actually called Mary's Spring. Now where Zechariah and Elizabeth had their house was actually what archeologists show was the house, the, the, the actual city or the small town of Ein Karem. The spring, like in every house at this time, was uh, further away from where people lived. So it makes sense that they would be here. Now Ein Karem, uh, is also where, again, Zechariah lived close enough to Jerusalem since he was of the priestly class. But he also, being part of that class, had some economic means. And so he probably had his house here in the city. And most likely on the hillside right in front of us is another place. And that's the place where usually people go and reflect on where Mary came to visit her cousin Elizabeth as soon as she knew that she was expecting the Lord because the angel Gabriel told her. And so most likely, as it says in the, in the gospel, when Elizabeth found out that she was expecting, she went into seclusion. In the town, that's hard to find. So she probably went up the road, up the little hilltop in, in you know, a small house in a vineyard and was able to be there and reflect on the miracle that was happening inside of her. So what is it that happened with Zechariah? Why are we talking about peace in this sense? in this moment and in this place. Well, not only does John the Baptist have a lot to do with the birth of Christ, Zechariah, in his conversation with Gabriel, the angel Gabriel, helps us to understand another thing about peace. In the book of Samuel, I believe it is, yes, it's 1 Samuel 17, David comes to visit his brothers who are in a battle. And he asks them, how is your shalom? How is your peace? So when we're talking about peace, it also means how is my well-being? How am I doing? And so when we think about Zechariah and what happened to him, we can see what happens with well-being. When we're looking at peace, we know, like we talked about in Nazareth, it's this, like this many bricks in a wall where one is missing, you know, peace is wholeness. It can start to crumble. It can start to break down. And this is what we see happens to Zechariah when, uh, Gabriel speaks with him. So let's go to, to Luke, and you can read that together. You have the gospel passage there in your Advent calendar. But he goes into the temple, and he's uh, offering the incense offering. And so this is what it says in the gospel of Luke. When he entered the sanctuary to burn incense, the whole assembly of people were waiting for him outside, and the angel of the Lord to appeared to him. Fear came upon him, and Gabriel says this, he says, your prayer has been heard. What was Zechariah's prayer? Was it like Mary's prayer for the salvation of the people? It very likely could have been. Many people think, oh, he was just praying for a son. He and his wife could never have a son. They were so old, I'm sure that wasn't his most recent prayer anyway. He was probably praying for the liberation of the people. He was praying for peace in a time of conflict. Your prayer has been heard, says Gabriel. Your wife Elizabeth will bear a son. How confusing. What? How can this be happening? And you shall name him John, says Gabriel. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, etc. But what happens to him? What happens to Zechariah? Even though he's told he will go before the one who will come, filled in the spirit and the power of Elijah to prepare a people for the Lord, 
He says, how shall I know this? I'm too old. There was a lot of confusion there. And that's when the angel said, I am Gabriel, who stand before God. I was sent to speak to you this good news, evangelion. That's to remember the Roman word for good news, meaning the emperor has come or the, the, the prince has come and he has conquered. He's giving him a lot of clues. And, and there's Zechariah. But then because of his unbelief and this, his stunnedness, this is what's happening inside. Gabriel says, you will be speechless and unable to speak until the day these things take place because you did not believe my words, but they will be fulfilled at that time. So what's happening to the shalom, the well-being of Zechariah? It's crumbling. It needs redemption. And you can tell that even in his lack of speech and in his confusion. So we know that he comes back here to Ein Kerem. In the meantime, Mary has come. Elizabeth, well, Elizabeth conceives when he comes back. She goes into seclusion, bringing us also back to what happened in the Old Testament with Rachel, with some of the, the patriarchs, and when the Lord blessed them. So this breaking down of the shalom inside, this need for restoration, is what's happening in this part of Luke. So when the birth of John takes place, Elizabeth, probably being up in the small house, comes back to her own home because this is where she can find help. And right here, beneath this altar, is the place where John was born in the innermost part of their house. And it says this in Luke 1, chapter, chapter 1, verse 57. When the time arrived for Elizabeth to have the child, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives were there. She was here, right? That's why they were all around. And they heard that the Lord had shown great mercy toward her, and they rejoiced with her. Then came the eighth day to circumcise and name the child. And the friends and neighbors, the town were saying, oh, he will be called Zechariah like his father. But she said, John is his name. Oh, but no one among your relatives has this name. So they made signs to the father. Zechariah for nine months had been thinking and praying about what Gabriel told him. He was being redeemed, the order brought back, peace brought back. So they made signs, it says in verse 62, asking his father in 63, it says, he asked for a tablet and wrote, John is his name. He's quoting Gabriel, he's quoting his wife. Order is coming back inside. Immediately his mouth was opened, his tongue was freed, and he spoke, blessing God. Fear came upon the neighbors, of course. They were completely just shocked by this whole thing. They saw the hand of God. Restoration was happening in this house. In other words, Zechariah had been shalomed. The friars have allowed us to come into these archeological ruins in the birthplace of John the Baptist. So we're going to show you different areas. If you follow me over here, we can uh, look at the archaeology to find the answer to the question, is this really the place where John the Baptist was born? Well, when they were doing the excavations, all the way in here you see mikvaot. Those are the purification baths of a first century Jewish town. And it would make sense that it's very close to the house of a priestly, a member of the priestly caste, which was Zechariah. And so you can see now we're walking over different parts of mosaics under our feet. And so what they've uncovered here, before we look down, we're going to look in front. And you see here something on both sides, these beautifully uh, carved pieces of marble. You can see here also a marble statue. Well, what happened here? We know that the Romans came. Remember when we were in Magdala? And they came and they not only conquered, they started putting their own temples in places that were considered important for the first Judeo-Christians. And so it's very telling that there was a temple right here that then was eventually destroyed. And this is very interesting. Uh, this is actually from a type of cannon. This is a little rock cannonball that the Romans would have used to destroy. Everything here is speaking about destruction and war. It's pointing us again and again to peace, which is what we're reflecting on. 
So if we look down at our feet now, we've got two different parts, two different levels of mosaics here. And then in this area, you can go all the way in and underneath this entire complex where they have excavated a monastery. And so the monks came as soon as the Edict of Milan was proclaimed. And that allowed Christianity or Christians to be able to build churches and live their faith. And so they came to places and protected places that were important for the first Christians. John the Baptist, being the one who prepared the way of the Lord, he was a key and continues to be a key figure in Christianity and in the Christmas story. So let's continue on as we go further into this uh, archaeological dig and look at more of the monastery. In this part of the monastery, you can see a beautiful mosaic behind, beneath my feet. The archaeologists think this was either the refectory of the monks or perhaps a small chapel. And it brings us up to another important part here in the excavations, all of which speak to us about peace. So in this part of the monastery, we see a beautiful mosaic, a Byzantine mosaic. In the center is a diamond, and it speaks about the martyrs in Greek. In honor of what martyrs? You know, you have the peacocks on either side, which point us to eternal life. And in the back right behind it, we see two tombs in this alcove. What does it mean? Well, the academics say that one possibility is because John the Baptist was so linked with Jesus as a child, it's in honor of the holy innocents that were slaughtered by Herod. Another possibility actually comes from the idea that, uh, well, actually the fact that the Samaritans came and they started persecuting uh, Christians and destroying their churches in the 500s and they would have come here as well. And so maybe it's in honor of the martyrs that were killed at that time. And there's a third intriguing possibility that comes from the apocryphal gospel of James. And in that gospel, they speak about um, a soldier that comes to Zechariah and he's asking where Elizabeth and the child John have been hidden. Where did they go? Because they were looking for John. It was a time of violence. At least it says that in the apocryphal gospel of James. And they had fled to the mountains and Elizabeth hid him behind a rock. But Zechariah said nothing. And so in that gospel, it actually speaks about him as a martyr. And so that connects us directly to those two tombs. There's only two little tombs in the back here. One for a father, perhaps, and one for his son. John the Baptist, we know, was martyred. His head was cut off. And Zechariah, like in James' gospel, who is also the martyr. Very interesting. But what this all points to, again, is our theme for this Advent, peace. We're making a pilgrimage of peace. This entire area is calling out for the Prince of Peace.